Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Enablement Brew podcast. I'm Carly Lehner. And I'm Melvina Alsai, and we're so excited you're joining us for yet another episode. And we're joined by a guest. Kunal, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, Carly. Hi, Melvina. Great to be here. Uh, finally, I think, right? It's been a while. Yeah. It's been in the cards for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, no, to introduce myself, I'm Kunal Pandya. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Sales Velocity Labs. Nice. I'm so excited to dive into that topic. I feel like it's so relevant, um, especially in the current climate, but also for all enablement folks tuning in and wondering how I should look at things and measure things and know that I'm successful and actually doing a good job. But before <laughs> we dive into that topic, Common question, what does everyone have in their mugs or cups <laughs> or I, bottles? I, I, I have, yeah. Is, it, is this a bottle or is it a jug? I don't know what to call it, but it's it's like a two liter water bottle. Um, and I'm on a bit of a water trip right now, um, especially with the temperature temperatures rising. Um, so yeah, I try and finish off at least two liters a day. That's what I've got. Good. That's my yeah, goal. Mor to it. Yeah, I'll, Morgan was I'll the try. same. Morgan on our last episode, he he had <laughs> something very similar. Canal, he was like, I'm obsessed with water right now. <laughs> you know, and, I've, yeah, I've, I've noticed a difference. I've noticed a difference just in terms of kind of how I feel, how I wake up in the morning, um, skincare, you know, all this kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> so so uh, it seems to be working. I like it. It's amazing how water can actually just make a big difference and right. I kind of hate it it's like that magic elixir that it's just been in front of our faces this whole time it's just drink more water um but I have um my second cup of coffee today just a black Americano we got a new uh new Nespresso machine um the other one we had for five and a half years and it finally fritzed out so New one, fresh cuppa. It's a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Need multiple of these. <laughs> Very nice. Well, I'm actually on the same. Um, I'm actually on the same. I have a coffee. Um, I don't want to tell you how I made this because I will be judged. But when I'm in a really, this is so bad, but I'll share the story. So when I'm rushing in the morning um, and I really want a coffee, so I drink instant coffee. Yes, I know. Um, but I'll put like two scoops of instant coffee and this is really bad. And then I'll go to the tap and I'll make the water lukewarm and I'll fill it and I'll mix it. And that is what I'm drinking this morning. So it's not very nice. I'm not going to lie, but I'll drink it. Um, so it's kind of like a lukewarm, cheap <laughs> coffee. <laughs> so you didn't even bother to boil the kettle this no. morning? No, I'm so bad. <laughs> this is a new low for you, Malvina. This is a new new low, but you know, like this is my second cup in the morning when I wake up. Nazri, my husband, he actually, I'm going to give him a shout out because he does this every single morning for me. He's the one that wakes up first. He'll go to the kitchen. He'll make me a nice cup of coffee. And he will always deliver it wherever I am. Um, so if it, I'm still in the bedroom, he'll bring it to the bedroom. If I'm in the bathroom getting ready, he'll bring it to the bathroom and he delivers my first cup. Um, <sighs> Nazri, if you're listening, make sure that never stops. <laughs> I'm, ta I'm, 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 I'm taking notes here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's the key to a successful marriage right there. Good job, the Naz. The only way and the only time I think there was maybe like two times since we've been married and we're almost married for 10 years that I didn't get a cup of coffee is if we've had a really bad argument, <laughs> <laughs> then I won't get my cup of coffee. And I know, Oh, okay. He's upset. He's angry, but it only happened twice, maybe once. Usually he's very consistent and I always get that cup of coffee delivered. <laughs> would, you guys, would, would you guys think I'm a little bit weird if I said, um, I don't really drink tea or coffee. <laughs> Marvina almost spit up, spit her coffee out there. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely don't want to drink this. <laughs> you know, there's definitely like I'm meeting more and more people who are like, yeah, I don't, I don't drink coffee or I don't drink tea. I'm just mm -hmm. like more power to you. Like I think I would probably 
I don't want to be melodramatic here. I would probably die if I just stopped drinking coffee. I have been drinking coffee since I was like 15 or 16 years old. Like I worked at Starbucks in high school. And so like, I just started drinking coffee at such an early age that I don't know if my body would function without it at this point. And so if, if you don't need that caffeine to get through your day, I, I just say more power to you. I wouldn't say I don't need it. I probably do need it, <laughs> especially <laughs> especially in the mornings. Um, but um, yeah, I've never been drawn towards it. I don't know if it's a taste yeah. thing or what, but um, I just pref- I've always preferred colder drinks. That's just the way it is. That's not lukewarm, parents. not lukewarm, colder. Yeah. <laughs> my parents used to tell me because um, I I don't think I had my first cup of coffee until I was maybe like eighteen, seventeen, eighteen. Oh, you can't drink it when you're young because it's you're not going to grow. <laughs> <laughs> there I was believing everything I was told, so I didn't drink. I drink like the herbal kind of coffees. I don't know what they're called. They have like a herbal kind of yeah, yeah, not very tasty. Um, but anyway, mm, fair. Um, well, anyway, we could probably talk about coffee, the the lies our parents told us growing up for hours, but we yeah. brought Canal on specifically <laughs> to talk about, um, well, first of all, Sales Velocity Labs, like that's a fairly new venture for you, Canal. so very yeah. excited to hear more about that. Um, but Malvina and I have had countless conversations over the last six to 12 months now about how can enablement prove its value and like what what metrics should we be measuring? And it's a very common topic. And every single time I always kind of come back to the sales velocity equation is a really good starting point. And the, the like genuine paradigm shift and how I think about enablement was can all your session at the sales enablement summit 2021 in London by the O2 arena personally, one of the worst places to have a conference. It is so difficult to get to, (laughs) but anyway, um, I just remember thinking, oh my God, that is so, that makes so much sense to take the sales velocity equation, which I'll have you define for our listeners if they've never heard of it um, or can't remember all the levers. Um, But it just is a really good way to kind of frame your enablement programs, the impact of them. And you kind of said before we started recording that you've done that session multiple times since then and it's evolved. So I'd love to hear a little bit more, but let's, let's kind of start like, how did you get to that? conclusion that sales velocity equation Mm. is is the one that we should really be thinking about in enablement how did i how did i get to that um and by the way that event we did in 2021 um where it's the hardest place in the world to get to do you remember there's a train strike that day as well there was (laughs) i remember (laughs) i remember walking like about two miles somewhere (laughs) it was awful (laughs) So, um, yeah, how, how did I even get to this? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. How did I get to this? And I, and I couldn't remember exactly how I, I, I think I just stum- I stumbled across it somewhere. I might have even heard somebody else talking about it um, mm-hmm. and seeing something about it. Kind of, what is that thing? Um, and then just doing a little bit of research into this and then realizing, hang on, why can we not tie enablement programs and initiatives to each of those levers of sales velocity, right? Opportunities, dual value, win rate, plan for sales side. I think most of the things we'd work on you know, align to one of those, or perhaps even more of those, right? Mm-hmm. Multiple, m- multiple uh, levers. So, um, and if we could do that, wouldn't we be able to kind of tie a little bit of attribution to the impact to revenue without tying enablement directly to revenue? Um, but that's where I started. Um, and, and obviously that hit a few hurdles. I hit a few speed bumps with that because attribution is hard, right? In any discipline. Um, but then I was kind of thinking, you know, when it comes to revenue and revenue being being attained uh, for, for businesses, marketing are looking for attribution, right? The salesperson obviously is gonna get attribution, whether they did anything or not, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> um, the, the pre-sales person is going to be looking for attribution. Product teams might be looking for attribution. Reasons as to why we generated revenue, right, is because of we did this, 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 and this. 
And I started, you know, it dawned on me, why are enablement in, not in that conversation? Right? Mm. Um, and when I connected those two things together, potentially a way to, to, to have attribution versus why enablement should be part of that conversation, that's when the connection was made. And I thought, okay, maybe we've got something here that we can actually use. And that's when I started to, to really talk about it. Um, and talking about it in these events and webinars and things was a form of ratification and validation that actually, yeah, there's something here, right? Um, and it's something that people aren't really doing. Um, and I remember that, the, the, I think the title of that, the, the event that we did was something around the most important metric you're not using, something like that, Yes, right? something like that, um, yeah. Right, and uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got to it. I love that. Um, I think if you look at the formula and you get a static number, it doesn't tell you a story. And I think what everyone craves, right? What CEOs, what CROs crave, what enablement craves is how can we tell a story over time? How can we tell a story of we've done this program, we've launched this certification, how does that tie in? And I think if you look at the numbers statically, they don't tell you a story, but if you look at them month over month or quarter over quarter or year over year, then you can very well tell a good story of what's happening. Are you looking yeah. at it in that way of how can we actually look at the different trends that are happening? 100%. Mm -hmm. And you, you said it so well, you know, the, the numbers paint a picture. It's the trends that tell a story. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the way I look at it is two ways. Um, the first way is is kind of that kind of right to left to start with the end game in mind and work backwards end game being revenue right it always starts with revenue and, and more specifically it's about what is our revenue in terms of what we're forecasting to do right where we're we heading and maybe even what, we, what what did we just do at the end of the year versus where do we need to be right so you might be looking at growth uh year on year of 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent maybe even in this current economy just keeping it stable Right, which is what a lot of people are doing. And, but keeping it stable is not as easy as it sounds, right? Given the economy, given the fact that we have budget freezes and headcount freezes and got, we're doing more with less and all these kind of things. Um, so keeping it stable is sometimes uh, an effort in itself and it's got an accomplishment in itself. But we start with that revenue gap, essentially. What do we need to do? And then those four levers of sales velocity, opportunities, win rates, deal value, and the sales cycle, essentially, especially in B2B, very much so in SaaS and a lot of kind of media type companies, telecom type companies perhaps, um, those are the only four levers that drive how much you sell, really, right? There, there's a ton of things below that, of course, right? But ultimately, that's it. Those are the four things. Um, now, when you're trying to define what, how we're gonna influence those, those metrics, you're kind of going right to left. You're starting at revenue, you're just looking at those, those metrics for sales velocity, and then you're kind of defining, well, how are we going to impact those things, right? What are the key priorities? What are the most important things? Where do we even need to focus, right? So I think Marvin, as you said it really well, um, it's the trends that play a part in that. Um, so if we take win rate, for example, we might see that win rate used to be 20%, right? Last year, this time last year. And month on month in the last 12 months, it steadily declined to 10%, which is what it is now. That's a concern, right? That's uh, the number of 10% might be a number, but it's going from 20 to 10. That's the, that's the problem here. Whereas, mm -hmm. say, average deal value might, be, might have been, let's just say, round number 50K this time last year. This currently, it's still around 50K, right? So is that as much of a focus, you know, compared to win rate, right? It, it's steady, we know that. So that's why the trends are so important. Now, if it's steady and we see win rate is declining, that's telling me we need to figure out how we're gonna impact win rate, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's kind of working backwards from revenue. And then of course, you know, there's the other direction, which is okay, we, we figure out what we need to do to impact win rate. We've done something, did it actually have that impact? And therefore, if it did, um, or whatever the impact was, what was the impact of revenue, right? So it's a two-way street. Yeah, we might have some revenue uh, <laughs> enablement leaders like writing down some numbers now on the back of a napkin. And 
maybe uh, noticing that all the different levers in that formula are actually trending down, right? Mm, That's yeah. bad. And then the question is, oh my goodness, everything is going down. Where do I focus? Where do we start with? Mm -hmm. What guidance do you give there? Because it's easy to isolate a single factor, but what if all the factors are trending downwards? Then you have multiple is, different problems yeah. you're trying to solve. How do you yeah. determine what should be that be all? What should be that one factor we're going to focus on first? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's actually something that I've come across in many companies I'm working with, right? Um, and in fact, it was um, a, a pavilion in Epster report, a, a sales benchmark report that they, that they did, which showed that, yeah, pretty much every factor is trending down was across the industry, right? Especially, especially across B2B SaaS companies. Um, so yeah, where, where do you start? Um, so again, it, it comes down to those trends, right? It's one, it's one factor, which is which one of these is trending in the most concerning fashion, right? It's down by 20% or whatever that trend line looks like, which one is showing the steepest decline. Um, now, knowing the trend is one thing, understanding why the trend is, is the way it is, is another, right? So there's, there's another layer to this, which is understanding why something is happening. Is it because of the market? Is it a competitor? Is it something that's lacking the product? Is it, is it a sales problem? Is it a skill that we're not having? Are we suffering from losses because of pricing because of value realization because of um object certain objections perhaps and whatever it may be um it's that drill down layer as to kind of what what it, what it is um but how do you decide which one of those levers you need to pull right um i think once you've done that little bit of analysis as to why something is the way it is it helps you to understand the impact of each kind of initiative or program that you might be associating with it. And along with that, the complexity to actually solve for it. So once you have the kind of all of these kind of point, data points, let's say, um, or kind of an anal analysis, what you're left with is, which are the biggest trends and what are the most concerning trends? Why are those trends there? What, what, what do we put it down to? And in order to solve for those things, what is the most simple things that we can solve that is gonna deliver the highest impact? Right. Um, so you might find, you know, actually one thing that I did see, this is a real example, was we found that win rate and dual value were the two things which were concerning the company the most. The trend lines were, were declining fast um, and it didn't seem to have any, any way of solving yeah. for it right, on, on face value. Um, we looked at that, we did some analysis and we found that the company's ability to deliver a business case right a business case was where, where they were struggling why because people just weren't doing it consistently they were doing it their own way there was no structural methodology around it um there's just no process right so they they, they didn't know what, what, what was happening what was being said so we, we tied that to dual value and win rate that's the first thing two things right the next thing was well what are the kind of leading indicators that are going to drive those two levers the leading indicators we broke up into three categories, competencies, um, process, and engagement slash adoption. Mm -hmm. So the competency here that we identified was a relentless focus on value-driven sales. Right? It's just a competency. It's just like kind of a, a word, right? But there's a lot of indicators be behind that, which says, how do we determine whether somebody has a, a relentless focus on value-driven sales, right? There's a competency which demonstrates that. The process behind that was the creation of a business case for every deal worth over, I think it was 100K in, in, in value. With that fail, mandatory, that's the process, we've got to do that. And the engagement and adoption of that essentially was the number of deals over 100K, which had a business case. But the key thing with these leading indicators was everything is measurable, right? That helped us to understand the impact that this thing could have and also how complex or simple it was, let's say, to solve for it, right? wasn't that difficult right? it was something that we could do the enablement side of this was essentially a value selling enablement program right so when you think about the code i've kind of dissected that i don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, the concept of simon sinek's golden circle where you start with the way go to the how mm -hmm. end with the what that's basically all i've done here but the why was revenue and the sales velocity levers the how was the 
the leading indicators, competencies, process, uh, engagement, and adoption. The what just happened to be the enablement strategy, right? It was this value selling thing. Um, the, the challenge that a lot of companies have is they start the other way. They start with, we've got to fix this thing, objection handling, and, and, and let's see what, that's it, right? It kind of stops there. Yeah. Um, so that's how, you know, I'm a bit of a long-winded answer, but that's how I've got to the point where we determine which of those levers we focus on uh, and then how we're going to actually achieve it. Yeah. The, the thing that is like probably the most important part of this canal is the access to the data. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your advice like for enablement professionals that are interested in this, but they don't know where to access this information or getting that yeah. data is, is really challenging. Like, what do you typically yeah. do? You know, one of the key barriers to doing any of this, 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 these things is the ability to actually do it, right? Um, the know-how, the, the skill. Um, and I found that a lot of people do shy away from it because it's, it's quite outside of the comfort zone, right? Data and analysis and analysis and analytics and all those kind of things. Especially if you're talking about these kind of things to executives, like within, within, within the business, where there's a risk of damage to credibility if you get it wrong, right? Um, or you're talking numbers to like a chief revenue officer or somebody like that. It's kind of, it's a dangerous you know, zone to go into if you're not confident. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a few things that I would recommend in order to kind of over, overcome some of those barriers. One is if you have a revenue ops function in your company, um, make them your best buddies, um, yeah. take them for coffee. <laughs> Um, not a lukewarm one, but take them, to the good <laughs> coffee, take them to the bar, do what you need to, to get them on the side. Um, uh, make them your best buddies because you're going to have to lean on them quite a lot. Um, secondly, none of this really works if your data is not there, right? If it's incorrect, if it's not uh, up to date, if it's not accurate. And we know, right, that people can take shortcuts in the CRM, create a deal the day before it's about to close, you know, all these kind of things, mm -hmm. which skews everything, right? Um, yeah putting zero values in or putting some arbitrary number in as a value, you know, and then up until the point it closes, it, 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 that, that is having a massive impact on not just things like what we're talking about here, but on the ability for a company to forecast its revenue. Yeah, That's okay. huge. That's yeah. a huge challenge, right? So hopefully a lot of companies have kind of gone away from that now, but um, if they haven't, then that needs to be solved for, for sure. Um, the third thing I would say is, you know what, if, if you're still kind of a little bit lost and just you don't have RevOps and you don't know if the data is there, the data is actually pretty simple, right? You're not doing anything different from what you're probably doing today. Most companies will have some kind of CRM, right? Um, in order to calculate these things, all you need is a list of opportunities. And within each opportunity, you don't need to know which opportunity is or what it is. You just need the stage or status of the opportunities open or closed. You need the value, right, which will, which will always be there. You need a creation date, which, which should always be there, and a close date, which will be there. Once you have those things, you can work all of this out, right? I've done this in Excel in the past. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so it can be done quite manually. Uh, sometimes it needs to be done manually. But, um, you know, as long as you have that level of data and that data set, you know, it, it can be done. The, the last thing I'll mention is I've totally recognize that this is a challenge, right? For a lot of people um, to, to, to get there and to do this. So um, one of the value propositions that I have as part of Celocity Labs is an online simulator, which helps you to calculate these things, input the numbers, but also simulate what is it that you need to actually do in order to hit your revenue goals. Yeah. Right? And then start to tie enablement programs to each of those things to, to really dissect it and say, Right. If we do these things, it's going to deliver this percentage impact, right? And those kind of things. So, yeah, have a look at the website if if interested, and um, there's a little tool that I can help. I love that. Um, I think just being able to understand like what are the different levers that you can pull to really make an impact is so powerful, and putting it in a format that's easily accessible, right, for potentially those non-techy, non-Excel whiz enablement leaders yeah. out there. <laughs> You know, yeah. that's huge, right? Because, you know, to our earlier right. point, we we all understand that having access to the data is important. 
probably a lot of us are doing things in Excel or trying to work things out in Excel. If you don't necessarily have a dedicated um, person or function in your organization who does that, um, yeah. you know, so, so that seems, that, that seems and sounds, um, incredible. What do you think is, what do you think is unique about your solution or what do you think is unique about what sales velocity labs is trying to do that maybe hasn't yeah. been done before? You know, the, the challenge I'm solving for ultimately is when I, when I talk to, to sales leaders, CRO, CSOs, VPs of sales, um, sometimes even enablement leaders, right? Um, and I ask them this one simple question, um, which is, what is the revenue impact of your enablement function? Just, just that's the one question, right? Um, that, the answer to that question is essentially my pitch, <laughs> right? So typically the answer is, I don't know, right? 90% of the time, the answer I hear is, I don't know. In fact, I did a bit of um, a, a, some studies on this. Some studies have done it, been done in the past as well. Um, so I think it was Sales and Event Collective, actually, you know, the, the metrics report that they produce annually. Um, one of the questions that they asked them there was, um, what is your confidence level in being able to prove revenue business impact to executives? And they said it was around 41% people are confident and able to confident, right? I actually think it's higher because being confident is one thing, actually doing it and doing it in a way that invokes action, right? But whether that action is, we're gonna invest in enablement more, we're gonna retain that team, we're not gonna fire them, we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna do all these kind of things. That's another thing, right? Um, uh, so that's the reason I think it's higher. I've done some kind of live polls, I've done some simulations, all these kind of things. I put it closer to between 65 and 70% are not confident in being able to prove business impact. Um, so, so that's the first thing that I do is, is ask that question. What is the revenue impact? And then if, we, if they're not able to answer that question, that, that, that kind of moves towards, well, how much are you investing in your enablement function today? Um, and typically what we'll see is they're getting something like less than 5% revenue impact if they're not able to answer that question. And, and the reason for that is because they're essentially putting enablement and it's being positioned as an operational function, right? It's being seen as an operational function as well. Um, so what do we mean by that? It's they're doing random acts of enablement, right? They're, there's no real long or medium or long-term strategy mm -hmm. as to what enablement is actually trying to achieve. There's a lack of alignment with business strategy as a result, right? Because it's random. Um, the, the remit of enablement is quite narrow as well. It's focused really on kind of training, maybe onboarding and content production of some kind, right? Um, and there is a broader rumor, as we all know. Um, and that means there's a lack of measurable program impact and there's no correlation to actual revenue impact. And because of all of those things, it's seen as a cost center. Um, and if you're as a cost center, especially in the current economy, there's a risk, right? There's a, there's a risk as to what's gonna happen. Um, yeah. The, the, something interesting that, I, that, I, that I've done in, uh, more recently is I've asked enablers, chief sales officers, the question around, if you were to ask your CFO, right, who is pulling those purse strings, who's looking for those budgets, who's looking to try to reduce costs, right, and reduce risk, if you ask your CFO, what does your enablement team do, right, what's their answer going to be? And they typically say, yeah, they're going to say they do training, right? or onboarding maybe, right? That, those are the two common answers. <laughs> and when we're not hiring anybody, it's like, what are they gonna do, right? Yeah. Um, so um, this, is, this is what I'm trying to solve for. This is exactly what I'm trying to solve for. How do we turn an operational enablement function into a strategic function by making it data-led, RRI-centric, and um, being able to prove business impact? The problem is there's no real playbook Right? There's no guide to do this. There's, there's lots of information on what we talked about, about sales velocity. There's a lot of that out there, but it stops at the point. Everything, if you were to Google this, you see hundreds of articles, but it, they all stop at the point when it says, how do you actually implement it in a way that allows you to define the right priorities and then measure against that? None of them go into that. That's what I'm trying to solve for by delivering a, a level of service, tools, and information that helps sales leaders to get to that, that end game.
I think that's so exciting. Like, I think it's a, it's a really good time for enablement and sales leaders to really think about this. And so when I saw that you had kind of made this pivot to do this, like as a real thing, I was personally just very excited for you, Canal, because I think you're a great person to, to help us do all of this. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what you guys, what you guys do and what you come up with. Cause yeah, it's, it's a really important thing for us to think about. And like, even when you said like, what's the revenue impact of your enablement team? Like I was thinking about that for my team and I'm like, Hmm, I probably could put this together, but I can't tell you right off the top of my head what that number is. And I think that is a glaring issue that probably a lot of us have. Malvina, I don't know if you know the answer for yours as well, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a really amazing question. Yeah. It's tough though, right? Um, I know what I, everything I've said is easy to say, um, yeah. very hard to do. Like I said, you could probably put it together. Yeah. A lot of people can't put it together. Um, and even if they could put it together, there is a, a, a huge risk of damage to credibility. Right? You're going to go to a CRO or CFO, someone who's, who's asking that question, and you're going to deliver some metrics and some analysis on that, and they're going to shoot it down. right? <laughs> yeah. um, and they're going to say, well, how can you prove that enablement was the thing that did that? Yeah. Yeah. Attribution is hard, right? Attribution is hard and um, you can't, right? So there, there are certainly hurdles and I've come across these challenges as I've been doing this. This is why I've evolved it. And one of the things that I say is um, you're never going to be able to prove 100% that enablement did this thing, right? that led to that impact. But um, I'll give a good example of something that I have done. Um, so I, I mentioned that business case example to you, right? Um, now, the reason why we did business case was because we needed to find 4% impact to win rate. Hmm. Um, this is like a, this is like a, almost a hundred million dollar company, right? Um, and 4% impact to win rate, um, was to take it to something like, something like 26% to something like close to 26 and a half percent, let's say, right? So 0.5% incremental gain on that, on that win rate. Um, and we did all those things. We did a business case thing, you know, every deal over hundred K. Um, and what we essentially, uh, determined was even if we don't achieve a 4% impact to win rate, right? And it probably wouldn't be. Even if we took a 1% impact to win rate, 1%, and that's 1% of 26%. So taking it from 26% to 26.3, let's say. 0.3% gain, that's a million dollars a year. Yeah. Right? It's a million dollars because we have, we, have we have the equation, right? We've got a calculation. It's that on its own, a million dollars. So is it worth doing this business case thing? Is it worth justifying the investment into it? Is it worth maybe even outsourcing something, right? Um, so you can get some budget to do to do something, maybe a platform, maybe some tech, maybe maybe just people, right, to, yeah. to help you deliver that. Of course it is. It's a million dollars a year. Um, yeah. So that that's me taking a worst case scenario. Worst case. Um, Mike Kunkel actually says um, sometimes when it comes to attribution, it's kind of like what's the most believable lie. And, <laughs> It's kind of right, right? Because because marketing can't one hundred percent prove that that situation, but but they get it, right? Yeah. Even the the salesperson, like we said before, I've been in sales deals where the salesperson's done pretty much nothing, right? Yep. They've just nurtured a little bit, they've done a few communication, but it's been a pre salesperson who's done everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen this, right? But they're going to get a hundred percent of the commission for that. Um, yeah. For that deal, so um. You know, it's what is the most believable line? And if you can just de de deliver a worst case scenario, which is like in a business case example, do we think by doing this business case thing, get everyone to do it consistently, structured in the right way, do we think that it can deliver a 0.3% impact to win rate? Yeah, it probably could, right? Okay, that's, that's yeah. probably, you're probably, you're probably looking higher than that. Yeah, right. But that's a million dollars. You're like, oh, great, let's do it. Um, well, that's, that's an excellent, I think, story to end on. Kanal, thank you so much for joining and, uh, we're very excited to have you talk about sales velocity. It's a, something that we all should be focusing on, but, um, thank you everyone for your tuning in to another episode of the Enablement Brew podcast, and we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you.